Hello, hello, hello. I just sat down with a refill of my coffee, decaf of course, second one of the day, and a glass of water, and let's jump into a beginner chess lesson. Before we start, I wanted to say something real quick. I made a video last night analyzing a game between two low-rated players, like in the 200s, and it really gave me a sense of purpose in doing these videos because I almost feel like I've unlocked a secret about how to help complete beginners. And it almost proved to me that this method makes sense and should be pretty effective in getting you to the next level of chess. So I'm super pumped about doing these videos. I'm gonna definitely keep doing them. Um, what I found is that when you look at a game between complete beginners, it all comes down to the blunders. They miss their own blunders, and they miss their opponent's blunders. And the first one who starts catching those is the one who wins. So in the game I analyzed, there were knights that were free and not taken. There was even a queen that was free and not taken. And then one player started taking some of these free pieces and ended up winning. So that is really the key at the... At the lower level of chess and it was making me think about learning in general uh, but especially chess there's two parts of learning there's the intuitive side and there's the analytical side so let me talk about that real quick what is the intuitive side of chess well let's give an example if i look at a chess puzzle um and let's see how do i do there's a way that you can see specific kinds of puzzles. But okay, let's just look at this puzzle. So when I look at this, uh, my eye is immediately drawn to the fact that these guys are both attacking that square. Like I don't I'm not even thinking about it. I just see it, right? And this is a distraction. I'm like, "Okay, yeah, I lost a rook, but look, look at this triangle. If I take that pawn, that's checkmate." That's mate in 1. Okay, so <laughs> I look at that and I didn't do any kind of analysis. I just saw it instantly. And it's because I've done so many puzzles that these patterns jump out to me. That's the intuitive part of chess. It comes from practice and seeing patterns over and over. And you don't even have to think about it. Your eye is just immediately drawn to certain patterns like shapes like triangles on the board where two, where your bishop and queen line up or batteries where your queen and rook line up. Like those are all just signals in your intuition. The other part of learning is analytical. And that's where you, you don't just see something, you are applying a process to discover things. What I mean is when we don't see the solution of a puzzle, like let's just look at the next one. Um, nothing, like, let's say nothing's jumping out here. The things that jump out are that my rook is under attack. Um, I've got a queen on this open file. But I don't see the answer. We, we've got a queen that's free for the taking, right? Uh, we're playing as black. And really, not much is jumping out to me. So that's where the analytical process begins. And we say, okay, I don't just see the answer. So now we need to go through a checklist. We need to say, what are we attacking? Well, not much. We, we're attacking the bishop with a pawn. The knight's not attacking anything. We are attacking this rook with our queen. That probably isn't good. And you start going through a checklist in your mind to, to discover something. That's the analytical part. Um, now, the point isn't to actually solve this puzzle. I just wanted to show the difference Intuition is when things jump out at you, and that you have to learn by practicing over and over and over, doing hundreds of games. The analytical part is what we talk about in our game, in our games against the bots, where we just slow down and we have kind of a list that we go through. What are the vulnerable pieces on my side and the opponent's side? Uh, are there any tactics? Like we have to think of those short little names, like is there a fork? Is there a pin? Is there a revealed attack? You know, we have names for them, and we can go through this checklist and search. And that way, they don't have to jump out at you. You can find them analytically. 
So that we're training both sides of our brain when we do that, when we do these chess lessons. Um, but you, you do have to do a lot of practice on your own to, to learn the intuition part. That's, that's kind of what I wanted to say here. We're practicing the analytical part by talking it through. And the intuition part you just do by repetition and practice. So anyway, let's start. We're going to use our opening principle of putting some pawns in the center. Our opponent is not challenging them, so we do it again. The other, th Oh yeah, the other thing I wanted to say, I should have done it before I started the game, is um, I think it's almost certainly true that you don't get as much out of watching analysis by really high level players, which sounds weird. Like, why don't you want the best? Why don't you want to look at the best? The answer is because our brains aren't ready for the best. We have to build up levels of both the intuition and the analytical part. That's just how we learn. We can't learn everything all at once. We have to do it incrementally. So step one is to stop making blunders. If you're making blunders, well, like if I just put my queen right here, I'm like, I'm gonna attack the queen with my queen. That's a one move blunder. And everything else that you do in the game isn't gonna matter because you lost your queen on move three or whatever. So you have to do that first. You have to stop making the one move blunders and you have to find your opponent's one move blunders. And then, you're, then the other stuff will start to matter more later on. But when you're at this level, there's no point even trying to learn a deep opening theory where you learn 20 moves of the London system and you end up with a very slight advantage that you don't even understand or see, right? So I feel really good about what we're doing so far and let's continue. So what is this queen doing? Whenever the queen comes out, we have to be extra careful. Look. The queen is going in all these directions that I'm doing with my mouse. So she's hitting this pawn and this pawn. And that's a thing that a lot of people forget. This is a little trap. If we just say, all right, this pawn is guarded and I don't like the queen being here, let's kick her out by pushing this pawn. She can just swing right over here, take that pawn with check and it's nasty. It, it can do, uh, your opponent can do some nasty things. So we need to look at all of our vulnerabilities. And this is the analytical part that I'm talking about. It might not jump out at you, but you can slow down, pause for a second and say, I'm just gonna highlight all the things the queen is attacking. Now, is there something I can do? Well, this pawn is guarded by my king, but I need to guard this pawn. How can I do that? How can I guard that pawn? And remember, um, we're going to apply, this is like a two for one. We need to guard the pawn. We also need to stick to our chess principles of getting our pieces out. So there's two options. Bishop to here guards the pawn and knight to here guards the pawn. Both of those are fine. I'm just going to do the knight one because I like to move the knights first. Okay. Interesting. Very good move by the computer. So he moved this knight out and he's attacking this pawn. The queen is also attacking this pawn. What do we need to do? We only have one piece defending it, but there's two pieces attacking it, so we need to get another defender. Let's do that. All right, he moved a pawn forward. That's not really hurting us. Now, what do we do? Well, we're not, we don't see any free pieces on the board, right? I don't see like a pawn that can take a knight. If there was, then that's what we, what we would do. So we're gonna fall back to our chess principles. Um, get the pieces out. We wanna develop our pieces. So I'm gonna develop this knight and as a bonus, that is going to attack the queen. So now the queen has to move. Oh boy. Okay, so I used to say, oh come on, this is ridiculous. But now I've seen things like this happen in real games between real people. They just don't notice that, that something got attacked. We're gonna take the queen, guys. You've gotta find your opponent's blunders. Remember, 
uh, remember what you are attacking. And guess what? This happened, a, a very similar thing happened to me in a game I played this morning. Now, I'm only rated between 1,000 and 1,100. I'm not like a great player or anything, but I'm not a complete beginner. And not only did I not see that my knight was being attacked by my pawn, but my opponent took the knight on the next turn, and I didn't even see that. I was so focused on moving my other, like I was like, yeah, I'm going to get this pawn forward and I'm going to attack there in like two or three more moves. So I put it forward. He took my knight. Then I moved another pawn. I didn't even see that he took my knight. I didn't even react to it. And then like 10 moves later, like all kinds of other stuff had happened. Suddenly I was like, wait a minute. Why is my opponent up a knight like how did he get that knight and i had to go back you know and look and be like what i did not even see that he took my knight it was bizarre but it happens to everyone guys and it just happens less the better you get at chess but we all have blind spots we all fail in both intuition and analysis it's two separate processes your intuition fails, and you can't really do much about that. It's just It just means that something doesn't jump out at you. You can't control that. Your analytical part, you would think, should never fail. right? You say, well, if, you, if I run through my checklist, I'll see that my knight is attacked. The problem is we get lazy. We get mentally lazy, and we don't go through a checklist. So um, that's just discipline. So as you get better at chess... First of all, you get faster at doing the analytical part. And second, you understand the value of it so you don't skip it. Now, anyway, we've talked a lot about learning. Let's continue the game. So knights do not like to live on the edge of the board. And we're going to have to do something about that. I also want to get this guy out. And we also want to castle our king. So we've got three things that we can do now. Remember when we say, um, if you don't know what to do, fall back to chess principles. But there is a vulnerable piece on the board right now. And this is, you know, I almost missed it because I've been talking so much. Did you see that the opponent moved this knight and is attacking this pawn? And what is guarding that pawn? That's right. Nothing is guarding that pawn. Nothing at all. So let's do something about that. We can either bring this knight back to here Remember, the knight is what was guarding the pawn. Or we can bring our bishop out to here. Both of those moves are fine. I'm going to bring the knight back. I don't know why. It doesn't really make a difference which one you do. But now that piece is guarded. Now let's get our bishop out. And where should we put the bishop? Here, 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 or here. Are all of those good? Is one better? Well... Here's what I would say. This is obviously the worst because it's that square is guarded. This is actually a really nice square because we're hitting the knight, and this knight is unguarded. The opponent has moved those pawns, so nothing is guarding that knight. This, squat, this spot is okay. It is hitting a weak pawn, so that's, that's good. But this square is unguarded, right? So we, we would have to keep an eye on that bishop. I kind of like this idea. Let's attack the knight. This is unguarded, and of course the computer misses it. So what are we going to do? We're, gonna, we're not going to castle. We're not going to say, chess principles say we have to castle. We're going to say we have a clear and good attack on the board. We're going to do that. We're going to ignore the chess principles. <laughs> and again, I'm not going to castle right now. Because we have a blunder. Our opponent has blundered. What should we do next, guys? Three, two, one. Take the rook. And now we can say, okay, not really seeing anything. Right? I don't see any obvious things right now. Like, this pawn is guarded by two pieces, so we can't take that. Uh, we're not attacking anything over here. 
My bishop is hanging out in a weird spot, but for now, he's fine. I'm going to castle. Let's fall back to our chess principles. And that's our, an that's our analytical process. So intuition didn't give me anything. I didn't say like, oh my gosh, there's a free piece there. The analysis didn't give me anything. I looked around and I said, well, all right, well, we're not really attacking much. So then we fall back to chess principles. And that's something you have to memorize. You have to memorize your chess principles. And let's, let's go over them real quick. Because I don't know if I've ever really listed them all. And I don't know them all. There's hundreds of chess principles. The better you are at chess, the more chess principles you know. That way you always know something to do in your position. But we can list a few that beginners should know. So chess principles. In the opening, you want to get some pawns in the center. That's one. That's an easy one. You want to... After you put one or two pawns forward, you want to start getting your bishops and knights out. We've already done that. That's a good chess principle. Um, a third one. When, when your pieces are out, it's time to castle. Very easy. Another one. Uh, knights don't want to live on the edge of the board. We've already taken care of that one. That was a dual purpose. Remember, we wanted to guard a piece and also bring our knight back. Another one, bishops like to be on these long diagonals where they can see a bunch of stuff. Now this bishop is not. We're blocked in right here and we're blocked in right here. So this bishop is not good. They don't get good until later on in the game usually when the pawns start clearing off. So we can't do much about that principle right now. Another one, rooks like to be on open or semi-open files. Well, right now, all of the files are closed. There are our own pawns are on every single file. Nothing has been traded. Nothing has been taken, right? And the last one that I can think of right now is when you're way up material, then you want to trade. You want to make as many trades as you can, right? And a trade means equal value pieces. Like if we could get trade this bishop for this bishop. Yes, do it. If we can trade this pawn for this pawn, yes, do it. So that is the only chess principle that I see right now that we can apply. How do we apply it? Well, we're going to have to attack the pawns. We, we're not attacking any of these pieces right now, right? And we don't really have an easy way to. So let's make trades where we can. Um, if we want to force a trade, what's better, pushing this pawn forward or pushing this pawn forward? Let me give you a few seconds to think about it. Three, two, one. The answer is this pawn. And here's why. If we push this pawn up to here and we say, okay, well, he'll take us, then we'll take him. He doesn't have to take. He can just push this pawn. And then it's locked up. We're never going to be able to take it. But if we push this pawn forward, we're attacking two pieces. It's a fork, right? And if he takes us, we take him. He takes us, we take him. We've actually made two trades, which is awesome. But if he tries to save his pawn and just push it, then we take the other pawn. So it's this is forcing a trade. So this is better. And now we are going to... Force, him, force a trade. So either one, it doesn't matter. Um, I'm going to go this way. I don't think it matters. Okay. Now, can we force any more trades? Um, well, not really. We can't force a trade because we don't have any more of those nice pawn forks. See, if, if I push this pawn forward, he doesn't have to take it. He can just push it forward. So we're not forcing a trade. I'm looking for forcing trades. Now, let's see. See, this is where I have trouble too. I look at this and I think, what do I do? There's so many pieces on the board. How do I get rid of them? And I'm trying to come up with a plan. And... To do that, it takes experience because you have to see patterns that are available. Uh, what I'm thinking right now is 
we want to take out some weaknesses. There is a weak pawn. There is a weak pawn. Weak bishop. Rook is unguarded. Knight is unguarded. Um, oh, this pawn is unguarded. So we're identifying weaknesses. That's kind of like step one. Then we're going to pick one of those things to attack. Now, this is a common, common pattern. These two pieces are one square apart. There's one blank square between them. That means if I can get a knight here, they are forked. Remember that? That's a pattern. And that's something that your intuition has to kind of get familiar with. Like, where are the forkable pieces here? For instance, the bishop and the knight are forkable. If if I had a knight here, they would... Sorry, did I say that? The bishop and the king are forkable. This knight is forking those pieces. If I could get my knight there, I would. Because I would pick up the bishop. Um... These pawns are not forkable. A knight cannot attack both of those squares. Either can a bishop, either can... Well, the only one would be a queen. If I could get a queen here, then both those pieces would be forked. But we can't do that. Our queen is locked away, way back here. But what I just said is if I get a knight there, we're forking two pawns. Let's do it. And he is attacking my knight, and that's fine. I'm going to take a pawn. Free pawn. Now, now we have to be careful. Can I jump back here and attack the other pawn? Nope, he would take me. What else just changed? He moved his bishop. What, uh, what little phrase do we associate with this? What just happened? Three, two, one. Revealed attack. Look at that. He didn't move his rook, but suddenly his rook is attacking our bishop. Now, our bishop is being guarded by the knight, so I'm actually not worried, but it's something to think about. We are going to have to get out of here eventually, because here's what's going to happen. What fork can our opponent do on the next turn? And this is getting a little more advanced. I do not expect you to see this, but it's something to start thinking about. You know, that I'm asking the question to help your intuition develop. What fork can our opponent play on the next turn? Three, two, one. This rook right now is only attacking the bishop. But if he moves here, he's attacking both pieces. That's a fork. And guess what? If we save our bishop by running away, well, he would take our knight, right? But if we take our knight away, if we say like, oh, I'm out of here, let's jump over here, he can take our bishop, right? Not to mention the knight is actually trapped right now, isn't he? Uh-oh. The knight can't jump here, can't jump here. Oh, no, he can jump here. So we do have an escape square, but that would lose our bishop. So let's get our bishop out of here. That's step one. We don't want to be forked. Um, where should we go? I'm going to go way back to here because I don't want to go here. The knight can, or the the uh, rook can still attack us. Uh, I don't want to go here. That's a free piece for our opponent. I don't want to go here. That's for the pawn. I'm going to go all the way back to here. Now we're attacking the knight. Aha! So he's defending his knight. But I want to trade. We're going to trade that piece. Oh, come on now. Okay. See, this is where the bot, I feel like, gets too much. But I just saw this in a real game. This really does happen. This really does happen, guys. So, time to save the bishop. We're going to bring him way back to... Where should we go? This is not a good spot. The king would take us. This is not good. The pawn would take us. This spot is fine, but he can attack us in one move, and I don't like that. This spot. That's my favorite. This spot is safe. It's guarded by a pawn. And we're attacking another piece, another pawn that's undefended. Let's go back there. Okay, he gets out of the way. That's good. Very good, computer. Right. Um, let's look and see what... We have available. We're not attacking anything right now. 
except this pawn, right? But I don't want to trade a bishop for a pawn. So, chess principles. Um, what are our chess principles? Can we get our rooks on an open file? Mm, there's an open file or a semi-open file right here. Oh, remember another chess principle. Get your rook on the same line as the king. So, there we go. That's my move. And now, to take advantage of this, I need to get my knight out of the way and then start pushing this pawn. So, but that's a little too advanced. We just want to make safe moves and wait for another blunder. And trades. We're trying to get trades, remember? Well, okay, I see one. I see a trade. Uh, it involves this pawn. So, tell me what you guys see. Three, two, one. We have a revealed attack against an unguarded pawn. So if I push this pawn forward, we're attacking this pawn and this pawn. And if he saves one pawn, he can't save the other one. All right? So this is forcing a trade. I'm going to go here. Wow. He's attacking our knight. Well, what do we do, guys? This knight is unguarded. So he can win that knight with his rook. Um, there are there are some tactics here. Let me give you a few seconds to think about this. The choices are, do we defend the knight? Do we run away? Or do we do something else? <laughs> okay, that's a little, that's a little too vague. Um, this is something we haven't really talked about yet. But sometimes, when your piece is being attacked, you can attack another piece of your opponent's and almost turn it into a trade, okay? So let's check this out. That This is a little too complicated, and I, but I think it's the best move. What we could do is, first of all, defend. We could put our queen here. That defends. We can also take our bishop, take that guy, right, that pawn, and the bishop is guarding the knight. So that's a second way to defend. Um, we could run away. We could jump back to here. We could even jump to here. Because, yeah, the bishop is attacking, but it's guarded by our bishop. So that would just be a trade, which we are totally happy with. Right? We could go back to a defended spot. The other thing that I was just talking about would be this. We take this pawn and we take. That's with check. So he cannot take our knight. He either has to take with his bishop or run away. Well, whichever one he does, we're going to take the bishop. So if he takes the pawn, we take with our knight. If he runs away, we take with our pawn and he takes our knight. It's basically a trade. Uh, that's a little too advanced, so I'm just going to run away. And I hope that you guys saw both of these squares... Which one we do doesn't really matter. They're both fine. I'm gonna run. I'm gonna run away back to here because I like this. I like that we're guarding the knight. And now, next. First of all, does your intuition say anything here? I'll be honest. Mine did not. But after a few seconds, I saw it. Okay, I'm going to give you a few more seconds with a hint. There's a big tactic on the board. Okay, next hint, it involves the knight. There's a tactic on the board with the knight. Go over the tactics. This is, if your intuition didn't yell it out to you, this is where analysis comes in. Discovered attack. Um, pin. Fork. <coughs> Do any of those jump out at you? And the answer is, there is a fork on the board. 
Look at the king and the rook. Boom, check. And then we take the rook. And he doesn't take us. <laughs> All right, so we need to save our knight now. Uh, his bishop moved. He's not attacking anything. He didn't reveal anything. So we're going to take the free pawn. And now we're attacking the bishop. See, this is a little ridiculous, I still think. Like, even in that game that I saw, it wasn't this ridiculous. But, yeah, let's take the bishop. Okay, and now there's a free pawn on the board. There's two. Which one should we take? With the bishop or with the pawn? I'm going to take with the pawn. And now we can go forward and get a queen. He's attacking our knight. I would rather have a queen than a knight. Um, all right, it's time to checkmate. Uh, I'm not going to even worry about this stuff. We're going to get our queen. Remember the strategy, guys. First step is cut off the king from moving down the board. How do we cut off this row so that the king cannot go and escape? Very easy. Queen to here. All right. We traded a piece. That is fine with me. We're going to grab it. Okay. We're going to grab it. Now, now that the queen is here, we need to give the king a check and make him go up again. How do we do that? We're not going to move this queen. If we put this queen here with check, um, that is going to let him escape. So I'm going to take this queen and go right here, guarded by this queen. They're right next to each other. This is a really easy checkmate. And now finally, one more move, checkmate. So that's the ladder mate. That is an analytical and an intuitive. Again, once you really get used to it and see the pattern, that ladder mate is just going to jump out to you. You're going to say, oh, yeah, I can cut off the king. Then I'm going to force him back to the very back, and then I'm going to checkmate him. Otherwise, you can do analytical as long as you remember the term and say, wait a minute, I've got two queens or a rook and a queen or even two rooks. I should be able to do a back rank or a, a ladder mate. How do I do that? And then you have to start going through a checklist like, okay, uh, cut off the king. Yeah. All right. Well, guys, that's it for today. I'm not going to do another game because I talked so much about learning and, and all that stuff. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you're following along and doing these little mini puzzles about, you know, what pieces are vulnerable, what what tactics are on the board. Um, when a piece moves, what is it attacking and what happened around it? Is there a, a revealed attack or anything like that? Those little mini puzzles are how you train your intuition. And until that intuition is trained, you can make it part of your analytical process. You have a little checklist in your head and you say, nothing is jumping out at me, so let me run through this checklist and just take my time and see if there's a blunder because that's how I'm going to win the game. All right, that's it. I hope you enjoyed it and I will see you next time. This series is going to keep going, guys. Bye.